Hi everyone, this is Daryl and welcome back to Book Odyssey. Today I'm going to be taking a closer look at a central theme of the Dune series, ecology, and how it relates to a somewhat controversial idea called the Gaia Hypothesis. One of the things that I find most absorbing about Frank Herbert's Dune is how Herbert approached the ecology of Arrakis, and how it's not only a major theme of the book, but that it also affects everything that happens in the story and every character in it. Ecology is the branch of biology that deals with the relation of organisms to one another and to their physical surroundings. We see this with the desert world of Arrakis, which we find out in the first three books of the series has such a delicate balance of systems that to disrupt one can have far-reaching and unforeseen consequences. This relates to an idea called holism, which is the theory that the parts that make up any given whole are interconnected and cannot survive independently from it. It also means each part of the system can't be fully understood without thinking about the whole in its entirety. In Dune Appendix 1, The Ecology of Dune, Pardo Keynes, the imperial planetologist of Arrakis, puts it like this. There is an internally recognised beauty of motion and balance on any man-healthy planet. You see in this beauty a dynamic stabilising effect essential to all life. Its aim is simple, to maintain and produce coordinated patterns of greater and greater diversity. Life improves the closed system's capacity to sustain life. This idea of the interconnectedness in this beauty of motion and balance has been compared to something called the Gaia Hypothesis, which was first discussed six years after Dune was published. The Gaia Hypothesis, named after the ancient Greek goddess of Earth, suggests that Earth and its biological systems behave as one huge single entity. This entity has closely controlled self-regulatory negative feedback loops that keep the conditions on the planet within the boundaries that are favourable to life. Introduced to the wider world in the early 1970s, the idea was first conceived by chemist and inventor James E. Lovelock and biologist Lynn Margulis. Lovelock formulated the Gaia hypothesis while working for NASA, and in it says that life has not been a passive passenger on Earth. Human-produced climate change, which is said to be largely a consequence of people burning fossil fuels, releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, is one of the ways many scientists say life affects Earth's system today. When it was first published, the theory was labelled mysticism by many. Others, however, reportedly came to see ecology as an example of a feedback system, one in which elements of the system react against each other in order to stabilise it. If we look at a line from that Dune quote again, we can see where the ideas align. You see in this beauty a dynamic stabilising effect essential to all life. Lovelock went on to create a theoretical model for how life can affect the surface temperature of a planet, a hypothetical planet called the Daisy World. This is a thought experiment where the Daisy World has two species of daisies on it, one that absorbs more light from the sun than its surroundings, the other that absorbs less. The daisies flourish in a range of temperature from 5 to 30 Celsius, and they can hypothetically spread over the surface of the world. The experiment goes that if there are more dark daisies than light, the planet heats up. If there are more light ones than dark, then the planet cools down. They found that instead of one species of daisy taking over, either heating or cooling the planet to extinction, the daisies coexisted to ensure the planetary temperature remained within a livable range. If we apply this theory to the ecology of Dune, we can see there are similar elements that compare to the daisy world, in that there is a similar dualistic system in place with the sandworms and the production of spice. In the story, the Fremen secretly work to alter the ecology of Arrakis to change it from an arid, hard desert world into one that has flowing water on the surface. To do this, they have to disrupt the sandworm cycle that ties up the free water that exists on Dune, beginning a generations-long process to introduce desert vegetation that stops the movement of the sand dunes, frees up the water, and cools the planet. Herbert reportedly got this idea from a project in Oregon in the US, which sought to stabilise the sand dunes, and in a similar fashion to this project, Herbert had the Fremen plant what he called poverty grass. This poverty grass was planted along the downwind sides of old dunes, where it stabilised the sand against the winds. 
Each stabilised area accumulated a higher windward crest after each sandstorm, which would in turn be planted with poverty grass until barrier dunes of more than 1500 metres height were produced. When barrier dunes reached sufficient height, the windward faces were planted with tougher sword grasses. Now the Fremen came in with deeper plantings. After this they turned then to the necessary animal life. But of course doing this had unintended consequences, both for the project in Oregon and for the desert world of Arrakis, one of which being the sudden and drastic reduction of spice production, which went on to cause an economic crash of the galactic economy. It had this effect because of the sand trout, which are the larval form of sandworms that exist in vast numbers in the sands of Arrakis. Many die as part of the natural cycle of the planet, but the ones that survive eventually grow over thousands of years into giant sandworms, which cannot live in a waterlogged environment. The spice is created in a process whereby the excretions of the sand trout mix with water to form a pre-spice mass. This mass would then be brought to the surface of the desert through an explosion of pressure, and under the immense heat and air of Arrakis, melange would form. Add excess water to this equation, and the life cycle is disrupted, meaning the gradual reduction in the production of spice as its unintended consequence. Now they had a circular relationship. Little Maker to pre-spice mass, Little Maker to Shai Halud, Shai Halud to scatter the spice upon which fed microscopic creatures called sand plankton. The sand plankton, food for Shai Halud, growing, burrowing, becoming little makers. Now evolved into the Gaia theory, the idea that a planet could be thought of as a single organism with many symbiotic parts is still one that scientists are debating even today. But it's one that I find fascinating for a number of reasons. One of these being, well, I'm a total nerd. The other is that I kind of like the idea of interconnectedness as it applies a type of order and balance in some sort of great organic machine that encompasses everything, even us as humans. If this isn't a perfect example of life being stranger than science fiction, then I don't know what is. To end this video, I'll leave you with another quote from Dune Appendix 1, The Ecology of Dune, which talks about the fragility of such a system like Arrakis and one proposed in the Gaia Hypothesis. Thanks for watching guys, and happy reading. The thing the ecologically illiterate don't realise about an ecosystem, Keane said, is that it's a system. A system. A system maintains a certain fluid stability that can be destroyed by a misstep in just one niche. A system has order, a flowing from point to point. If something dams that flow, order collapses. The untrained might miss that collapse until it was too late. That's why the highest function of ecology is the understanding of consequences.